Greetings. My name is Joel, and I serve on the staff here at Panama Baptist Church. Thanks for being here. Thanks for making it a priority to join us. If you're with us at the live chat gathering and you haven't already, please say hello in the chat box there. We'd love to be able to greet you, to encourage one another. If you have some prayer requests that you'd like to share, we'd be honored to pray on your behalf. Uh, all right, just a little fun fact to start your day. If you're watching this on Sunday, May 15th, did you know that on May 15th in 1940, 82 years ago today, the first McDonald's opened? It's true. So we're celebrating a momentous occasion today. You can impress your friends with that fact around the dinner table later on. <laughs> all right, as we get started in our time together, a couple videos that we have for you. Uh, we had a baptism at our in-person gathering last week that we wanted to show you so that you can celebrate and rejoice in God's grace along with us. Uh, after that, the James and the crew is going to come and lead us in song. But before we watch the baptism video, if you've been around, you know that we encourage folks to, to drop grace bumps. Uh, Pastor Andy did a series on this several months ago, uh, showing God's grace to the people around us in the same way that God has shown grace to us. Uh, and so here's a little reminder about that from the Grace Bomb organization founder, Pat Linnell. Uh, take a look. Hey, what's up, everybody? Pat Linnell back with you. It's May, so it's time for the May Grace Bomb Challenge. But first, a little recap. When we talk about grace bombing, we say load, listen, and let her go. Loading means picking up some grace bomb cards. Now, in the spirit of Grace Bomb Day, which is coming up on May 16th, we have a limited edition Grace Bomb card, these bad boys right here. And if you don't have your hands on them already, you can pick yours up at gracebomb.org. We call these the Light em Up With Love edition cards. So you have some cards on you, and then you go about in your everyday walk of life, and you listen. And when we say listen, we're really just talking about listening to Jesus and taking him seriously when he compels us to love our neighbor. So we listen to him and we look for those opportunities to invest our time, treasure, or talent in a surprising manner in our neighbor. And then we do perhaps the hardest step of let her go. This is getting out of our comfort zone, blessing a neighbor, surprising a neighbor, and gently implicating Jesus. And that's where those cards help out a little bit. But that's not the challenge. That's just Grace Bombing 101. Here is the May challenge. Load, listen, let her go, and then let us know. After you drop your Grace Bomb, go to gracebomb.org and share your story, how it went or even how it didn't go. Because we're also compelled in the scriptures to spur one another on to love and good works. And wouldn't you know that right now, the onlooking world, looking in at followers of Jesus, his church from coast to coast, they tend to see a cold, hypocritical, judgmental group of people. But let me remind you that being the light of the world feels good to other people. Light is warm and light is inviting, and we should be driving the cultural conversation of kindness. And we share stories so that we can hear good, creative ideas of ways that we can love our neighbor in our everyday walk of life. Now, you can help Grace Bomb the movement hit a great milestone this month. We're about 75 stories away from hitting 1,000 stories shared on gracebomb.org. This is awesome, and it's something to celebrate, and we want to get to 1,000 stories this month. So, would you load, listen, let her go, and let us know this May as you step out Light them up with love and truly carry out a movement of obedience to Jesus. We focused on our missionaries this morning. They're, you know, they're, our missionaries are serving with the intention of making disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus commanded his followers to do that, to make disciples. We talk about this passage all the time. Matthew chapter 28, to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's happening there in Alaska, it's happening around the world, and it's happening here at PBC too. Uh, we have another opportunity, we had one a couple weeks ago, we've got another one today. We have an exciting opportunity to witness a baptism together. Uh, this morning we're going to have the privilege of witnessing the baptism of Connie Damcott. 
I said this a couple weeks ago, but I want to say it again in case maybe you're not as familiar with baptism or the way that we do it. Baptism is an external sign of an internal reality. There's nothing magical taking place when we immerse somebody into the waters. The act of baptism doesn't save you, but only points as a symbol towards your salvation, towards the reality of your salvation. It lets the world around you know that you have a desire to follow Jesus Christ with your life, that you've put your faith in Jesus and that he has saved you from your sins. Uh, It's been a pleasure for me to get to know Connie. She had approached us several weeks ago just about membership. She wanted to be a part of this body, to belong here with you. And so as we got to talking, we started talking about baptism, and Connie said she had never been baptized by immersion in her life. But it, she wanted to do that. After, after opening the scriptures and talking about why do we believe in baptism, why do we think this is important to do, why do we think Jesus has commanded us to do it, why do we teach it, she listened to all that and she said, I want to do that. I want to take a step of faith and obedience and be baptized and then join us here as a member of PBC. So this is a time for us to celebrate together with Connie, to celebrate in the grace of Jesus Christ and the faith that he has shown to Connie. So at this time, I'm going to invite Connie down into the water, and she's going to be accompanied by her son, Brian, as they're making their way down into the water. uh, Take a look at this video of Connie's testimony. I was raised in a church atmosphere. I attended Sunday school and church regularly. When I was 10 years old, my friend Pauline and her mother invited me to join them in a church service uh, at their church. That night I went forward when they gave me the invitation to accept Jesus as my Savior from sin. I needed a Savior because I was a sinner who needed the saving power of Jesus Christ and that any sin great or small, was sin in God's eyes. Then as a young adult, I attended several Bible studies and I began to understand what it meant to be a Christian. I believe the Lord guided me through my teen years and helped me to make some good choices. I continue to grow closer to the Lord as I try to give Him complete charge of my life. My goal is to do it His way. And this is a daily prayer. I want to be baptized by immersion because Christ commanded me to be. This is an outward sign that I have made a spiritual decision to receive eternal life through Christ. Baptism is the act that shows my family and the world that I have accepted Jesus as my Savior and that someday I'll be in heaven watching for them. I would like to thank my grandmother Patterson, who prayed for me every day as I was growing up, my loving parents, Meryl and Marion Patterson, who loved me so much and gave me a church foundation so that I was open to the gospel, my lifelong friend Pauline, who invited me to go to church with her, and Christians who are doers of the word, and I see Christ in their lives. My name is Connie Damkett, and I want to follow Jesus. Amen. Connie, I've heard your profession of faith. You have expressed to me that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that you believe he died on the cross for your sins and was raised on the third day, and that you have trusted in Jesus Christ for forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. So, Connie, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hi there, my name is Andy Cook, and I'm part of the staff here at Panama Baptist Church. I'm really glad you're able to join us today. This is a series about identity. And in part one of our series, we talked about how do people go about determining their core identity. And I made the observation that if you don't get your identity vertically, by that I mean you get it from God, let God say this is who you are at your core. 
then you're going to look for it elsewhere. And you'll probably look for it horizontally in terms of like your roles, the tribes, that's the people that you hang out with, your performances, accomplishments like that. Or you'll look for it internally through your preferences. In part two, we talked about the four parts of every Jesus follower's core identity. And I made the statement that at your core, you are an image bearer, right? You are a lion tamer. You are God's friend and you are a body part. Well, this is part three. And in part three, we're going to look at the connection between identity and habits. Plus, why is it so hard to change our habits and what can we do to make that a little bit easier? So that's where we're going to be in just a few minutes. When our kids were young, uh, we had a few household rules, and our kids knew exactly what those rules were, and they also knew the consequences for disobeying any of those household rules. And uh, so, you know, if they disobeyed them, they got caught, then the consequences were administered to them. Well, no surprise there. Where it was a little bit challenging for me as a parent is when, uh, let's say, my kids uh, disobeyed two of the rules or perhaps all three of them at the same time. And so now the consequences would stack up and I, I didn't really want to administer that much discipline. And so sometimes I would say to them, look, this is what you did. This is what you deserved. And they're like, yep, yep. Dad's going to give you mercy. And mercy was code for you're going to get less than what you deserve, right? You're not going to get all the, the discipline that you deserve. So one day, my son Jonathan had, had broken some rules. And I can't even tell you which ones, but it, the, the punishment would have stacked up pretty good for him. And he looked at me and he said, Dad, today would be a good day for mercy. Yeah. I have days like that too when I want to go to my Father in Heaven and say, God in Heaven, today would be a good day for mercy. That, that's awesome when you get to give mercy. It's awesome when you get to receive mercy. But what would you say to someone who's already received a lot of mercy or a lot of grace it, to motivate them to change their ways? In other words, what would you say to someone who every time they, they uh, disobeyed or whatever. They're like, today would be a good day for mercy. You know, they got the little puppy dog look in their eyes, right? What would you say? If you want to motivate them to change their ways, I mean, would you warn them that the grace or the mercy might just run out? Maybe. So it's kind of a similar situation going on in the book of Romans. Paul explained to the Romans that God had been gracious to them in bringing them back from the dead spiritually, and that the more that they realize how sinful they were, the more obvious God's grace really is, and that the more they realized what God's rules were, the more they had seen God's grace. This is Romans chapter 5, verse 20. It says, but where sin multiplied, in other words, where they recognized that they had more and more sin, grace multiplied even more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that led to a question then, right? If as they had more sin, grace multiplied even more, and God was given an amazing credit and, and praise for being so gracious, it led to a question. This is chapter 6, verse 1. What should we say then? Should we continue to, in sin so that grace may multiply? Right? That's a good question. Answer, very straightforward. Paul nails it. He says, absolutely not. Back to what I talked about with my son, John. I mean, can you imagine? He looks at me and he says, Dad, should I just keep disobeying so that you can give me even more mercy and become known as the most merciful dad in all of greater Panama, New York? <laughs> absolutely not, right? No, absolutely not. So the answer doesn't shock us. But the reasoning, the explanation is quite surprising. I want you to, we're going to look at it in just a second, but I want you to notice when we look at Paul's explanation as to why we shouldn't continue to sin, notice that Paul does not say, don't sin because God's going to change his mind about being gracious if you do. Paul doesn't say, do not keep sinning because the mercy does have a limit and you will reach it. Paul doesn't say, don't sin because if you do, God's going to disown you. Paul doesn't say, don't sin because if you do, then God's going to take away your salvation and you'll no longer be his child. He doesn't say any of that. 
catch what he does say and how he explains to them why he would say so strongly, absolutely not. Here it is, Romans chapter 6, verse 2. Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in the likeness of death, we'll certainly be also in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified, that's key, with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless, so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we'll also live with him, because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Now, death no longer rules over him, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Elsewhere, when Paul was speaking to the Galatians, he, he just gave his own testimony about this same idea. He said this, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's the explanation that Paul gave to those Romans who were asking the question, hypothetically at least, should we keep on sinning so that grace will multiply even more and so that God will get all this praise and glory and credit for being the most gracious God ever? Paul's explanation was this, don't sin because that isn't who you are. You no longer are a slave to sin. You, or we could say it this way, no longer do what you used to do, sin, because you no longer are who you used to be, a slave to sin. Jesus follower, listen to me, slave to sin is no longer part of your core ID. It's been replaced by God's friend, right? We didn't talk about when we were going through this core ID earlier, but really and truly, if all humans at their core are slave to sin until God intervenes. But for you who are Jesus followers, slave to sin is no longer part of your core ID. It's been replaced. You have a brand new ID, and that new identity needs to be lived out. Now, there's a Bible word for that. Sanctification. Sanctification. Sanctification is the process of becoming who you already are. It's a transformation in which behavior catches up with your identity, right? You are a saint, that's who you are, but you and I often are not living like saints, right? Our behavior has not caught up with our identity yet. And sanctification is the name we give to the process, the name we give to that transformation in which our behavior is slowly catching up with our new identity. And sanctification largely takes place through identity-based habits, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, and through Christian community. So the idea is this. What Paul is saying to us is, let your identity determine your habits. You, your old identity was slave to sin, but that's not who you are anymore. So don't keep the same habitual sins that you used to have when you had your old identity. Let your new identity determine and drive your brand new habits. All right, so let's continue with what Paul's saying there in Romans chapter 6. And you will see that he says to you and to me, all right, since you're no longer who you used to be, now let's live that out through the habits. Let's make a habit of offering your parts to God to do his will. Your, your body parts, your mind, your hands, right? Your, your heart, everything that makes you, you. All right, Romans chapter 6, verse 12, he continues, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it, your body, to sin as weapons for our unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law but under grace." What then? Should we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? Absolutely not. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, 
either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. And having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. Now, I'm using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. So what fruit was produced then from the things you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now, since you've been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. So Paul's saying to us, listen, you have a brand new identity. You are God's friend. You used to be slave to sin, but now you're God's friend. Now live that out habitually by making a habit of offering your parts to God to do His will. So start with your identity, right, God's friend, and reinforce that through actions that become habits. And Paul explains that this is the path to sanctification, which is what your brand new heart that you have in God longs for. Your heart wants to be sanctified. He also points out at the end that the outcome of this pathway, of, of going through this transformation and cooperating with God, you know, as you live out this new identity by building actions that lead to ha habits, it results in eternal life and it results in freedom. That is awesome. So that's Paul explaining to us the link between identity and our habits. I want to step aside from that for just a moment and look at some of the work that James Clear talks about with the same idea. James Clear is a present-day authority on habits, and he writes this uh, in his book, Atomic Habits. Changing our habits is challenging for two reasons. One, we try to change the wrong thing, and two, we try to change our habits the wrong way. Let's focus on the first of those two. We try to change the wrong thing. James explains that there are three layers of behavior change, right? A change in your outcomes, a change in your processes, or a change in your identity. So like a change in your outcomes, that would be like I lose weight. That's the outcome. You know, if I diet and I exercise or whatever, the, the outcome is I lose weight. There's a change in your processes. Those are the things that you do, the habits, right? I exercise, I diet or whatever. And then change in your identity is the innermost one. This is a change in the belief about the type of person that you are, who you are at your core. James continues. Many people begin the process of changing their habits by focusing on what they want to achieve. And this leads to outcome-based habits, right? I want to lose 20 pounds. Right? The alternative is to build identity-based habits. And with this approach, we start by focusing on who we wish to become. I wish to become a recreational athlete. Or I wish to become a reader. I, the goal isn't to, isn't to read five books a year. The goal is to become a reader. That's what he's differentiating here. So the address is the same things, but the order is different, right? With, with outcome-based habits, we start at the outside with a goal and we try to work that in by you know, setting the goal and then trying to change some processes, hoping that eventually it'll change who we are. James says, no, work the other way out. Start at the inside, right, with who you are and change what you believe about who you are and then work to create habits with, that will reinforce that identity, who you are, and that's going to change your outcomes. He continues, true behavior change is identity change. Anyone can convince themselves to visit the gym or eat healthy once or twice, but if you don't shift the belief behind the behavior, then it's hard to stick with it long-term changes. Right? Improvements are only temporary until they become part of who you are. Every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. Now, this vote, in other words, what he's saying is when I perform an action, let's say I read five pages in my Bible today, that casts a vote, a believable vote, for I am the kind of person who reads God's Word and spends time with God every day. 
If I do it tomorrow, that's another vote. If I do it the next day, that's another vote. And the more votes I have, the more believable it is that I am that type of person that I say that I am or I am becoming. So James admonishes us to start by answering, who is the type of person you want to become? And then, with that clearly answered, move on to the second question, which is, what is one habit that casts a small vote for becoming that type of person? So use identity-based habits to reinforce ID, who it is that we want to become, because, as James has noted from the research, changing identity is the most effective way to change behavior. The most effective way, according to research, to change our behavior is to change what we believe about who we are, change our identity. Now, let, an example of how I, working on this in my own life. I, I, instead of being you know, a person who says, boy, I, I, should, I should exercise more, I am instead focusing on, I'm the type of person who receives active time as a gift from God. I'm God's friend, and so one of the things that God does for me as his friend is every day he gives me time to be active. I call it active time. You could call it exercise time. But I'm the type of person who receives that as a gift. And so when it's time to ride my bike or go for a walk or whatever, I look at it and I can start by saying, God, thank you so much that I have this time again today and there's nowhere else I need to be. There's nothing else I should be doing. This is a gift from you. Thank you so much for giving this to me. This is a life-giving gift. So I'm starting in that example, right? I'm starting with who it is that I am. I am God's friend. And I'm the type of friend that receives gifts from God and says thank you for them. And I'm receiving active time or exercise time as a gift from my friend, God. If I do that, if that's the mentality that I nurture, and then I go out and I cast believable votes for that by saying thank you as I'm putting my shoes on and then head out the door and do that day after day, I'm casting believable votes for this person that I am. I am the type of person who's God's friend and receives this act of time as a gift from God. If, on the other hand, I go the other way and I go, you know what, I, I, just, uh, I just should exercise more. As soon as I say that, what I'm really saying is, <laughs> I'm the kind of person who should do things, but I don't often do what I should do, so I'm probably a pretty undisciplined person. Now, if that's what I believe about myself, which might be true, by the way, but if I believe that, how difficult will it be for me to truly make exercise a lasting part of my lifestyle? That's the point that James is making, is that we don't make lasting change when we start with the outcome, or when we start even with a habit. We make lasting change when we start with uh, letting uh, our new identity, who it is we want to become, drive the habits that will then eventually produce outcomes. So let me put these two ideas together, right? Identity is a great way to determine which habits you want to build. And habits are a great way to reinforce your identity. There's a link here. These two go together, right? The identity helps us know which habits we need, but habits reinforce our identity by casting these believable votes for the fact that we are who it is we are wanting to become or who we actually are. Now, I also want to do a quick aside for you and differentiate between what the Apostle Paul and James Clear are saying. The Apostle Paul is explaining how to become who we truly are by using habits, right? Sanctification is about becoming who you really are. You really are a saint. You really are God's friend, right? James Clear is explaining how to become who we hope to be by using habits. And for those of you who've been around the Bible for quite a long time for fun, you might want to do this. Try to tie this all together with what the Apostle James wrote about uh, when he talks about faith and works. How does faith and works play into this becoming who you are and, and all of that? That's, that's a really fun thing to work through in your mind. 
I'm going to state it this way. Here's the big idea for, for today. And if you catch nothing else, catch this. Our core identity is reinforced and lived out by our habits. Our core identity is reinforced and lived out by our habits. Both parts are true. So we can say it this way. If you want to truly believe that you are an image bearer, lion tamer, not God, God's friend, and a body part, and you want these parts of your ID to remain core, then you'll have to vote for these IDs through actions that become habits. Does that make sense? If you really want to believe that you are an image bearer and a lion tamer and all that, and you want those parts of your core ID to remain the core and not get displaced by something else, you're going to have to vote for those IDs through actions that become habits. So as we think about the various parts of our core ID, right? The question is, what is one habit that would cast a small vote for that particular aspect of our core ID? For example, I'm an image bearer, right? What is one habit that would cast a small vote for me being an image bearer? As we go through these various parts of our core ID, I'm going to give you a few examples of habits, that, small habits that you could do. I'm not asking you to adopt those habits. What I'm asking you to do is to consider the question, what's a small habit that I could do, that you could do, that would cast a, a believable vote for you being that? What is a small habit you could do that would reinforce that as your core identity? So for image bearer, here's one I've been thinking about. Uh, for me, the focus is more on me remembering that it's not just me, but all the rest of you are image bearers and you have that dignity and, you, and worth. And so one way to, uh, to do that, to reinforce that, a habit is this, is to ask others for what I desire. You're like, what? Yeah, so in other words, if I would really wish that you would do something for me, ask you. You're like, whoa, whoa, how does that, how does that, became, making that a habit, how does that reinforce that you think I'm an image bearer? Because this, if I ask you for what I desire, I'm not just hoping, I'm not in any way going to try to manipulate you, right? I'm not going to try to trick you into, I'm not going to try to extract it out of you. I'm asking you, and when I ask you, I'm asking you in a way that is giving you perfect opportunity to say yes or to say no. I'm affirming that you are a person who is worthy of me giving you choice and me not trying to in any way manipulate you or do anything to get you to want to do what I want you to do apart from your own choice and your own goodwill. And so as I do that, if I make that my habit of asking you for what I desire that you'll do and then allowing you to choose I'm reinforcing in my mind, you are an image bearer. We said last week that I am a lion tamer. I had, to, I had you read it with me, right, and say it with me, I am a lion tamer. What's a habit that would cast a small vote for you being a lion tamer? I, I, I've got one idea. You know, adopt a cause in which you make the world better or you undo the effects of sin, right? You pick a cause that you can plug into that fits both your passion and your abilities and your resources, and you do that. And as you do that, engage in addressing that cause, addressing that issue, making the world better, undoing the effects of sin, you are reinforcing this idea that you are a lion tamer. You keep on going. I, I am not God. So what's a habit that I could adopt that would cast a vote for my belief, my understanding that I am not God? I, I am God's friend. What's a habit? that I could adopt, that would cast a vote for me being God's friend. I, I thought immediately of Grace Bomb in this category, where I'm like, I'm loading, but I'm listening to God. I'm like, God, you and me, it's anybody you want to Grace Bomb today, right? If I Grace Bomb, or at least if I listen, I load and I listen, and I'm prepared to let her go. As I do that, I am, <laughs> through that habit, Casting a vote for my core identity as God's friend. I'm a body part. What's one habit 
that I could adopt, they would cast a small vote for me being a body part. You, you could come up with examples. I, I gave you several here just to consider. Let's wrap this up. As you think through your core identity, think through maybe some of your other identities that maybe are not core, you know, the roles that you have, the, the groups that you're part of. Which identities did you cast a vote for this week? I encourage you to think about that. Which identities did you cast a vote for this week? You know, you did some action. Maybe you had a habit, but it cast a vote for it. It gave evidence to the fact that this is your identity. Which identities did you act on and maybe have a habit for? Cast a vote for this week. And then secondly, who are you already? but definitely still need to work at becoming. Is there something that the Holy Spirit is just impressing on you? Like This is an area where you're not behaviorally what you are in status. Who are you already, but still need to work at becoming? I encourage you to think about these two things, and, and then we'll be ready to jump on this more next week. Because next week we're going to talk about how do you actually build those habits, right? And specifically, how do you... Build habits that reinforce your core identity. I look forward to sharing that with you in part four. Our benediction verses for the week come from Revelation chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. I'm praying for you this week. May God remind you of His grace and His love and His mercy that is new every morning. If you need some help this week or you just need someone to talk to, you've got some questions about some things that you've heard, please reach out to us. Give us a phone call, send an email, drop by the offices. We'd love to interact with you. We'll see you next time.